I want to show you, and in this way, you can also help um, the people who who are absent. Um, so yesterday was Monday. Here's our absent post. Cut vocabulary flashcards. Watch my video notes number one through thirteen. Be sure to watch the additional video or videos that go with this section as well. So here's the filled in notes. So um, I think Lexi was our only one absent. Um, so she could look here and do slides one through three. Get those filled in on um, you know her set of notes. This is the video set of notes. And if somebody um, would let me know, make sure that you um, that these are opening and playing for you. Like next time you get a Chromebook out, and I'll try to maybe homeroom Caden or Aiden. Um, maybe I'll have you check just to make sure those are actually opening. Um, and if something doesn't open right, like one of our game links or anything, if I have it on there, I think that it's working for you. And so if you guys can let me know, like, hey, this isn't working or the, it says it can't open or something like that, please let me know that because I don't know unless you tell me. Okay, so I really appreciate that. Yeah, do you have any of your stuff? I think I left in blocker. Okay. So you're going to need to go get it. You're going to need to sign out as quickly as you can, and you're going to need to go get it. I'm going to mark you down as being unprepared. That is your first one, okay? All right. Um, so that's there. Please, if you're absent, watch the video notes. It is a lot more in-depth than just filling in those five or six or ten words that you might from the paper notes. Obviously, you need to have your paper notes complete, so you need to get those filled in. But actually, watching the video notes is going to be a lot more in depth. You'll hear our questions, you'll hear our um, conversation, you'll hear a lot more in depth explanation on things. Okay, so please make sure, and I can see who watches this. Like I can see how many views and things there are. So if I have three people absent, I should see that three people watched you know, this, this video from yesterday. Um, and typically I will have this posted. It takes a little bit um, for the video to upload to my phone. Um, and then I can post it. So usually by the afternoon, I'll have it posted. So just trying to get you, um, you know, aware of kind of our routines. Um, the other thing is, thank you, we have a ton of songs in here. And so the song yesterday, um, so I used to teach fifth grade. And then I moved um, to teach eighth grade in high school. And when I had... Um, I went to one of the football games, and when the there was the group that I had the previous year, when they were sixth graders, they came running up to me at the football game, and they were like, "Oh my gosh, we just had a quiz on the scientific method with Mrs. Radel, and all I had to do was hear that song in my head, the scientific method song, and I knew everything I needed to know." And so that made me really excited. And again, this was years ago, but it was pretty cool because I was like, "That's exactly what the songs are meant to be." So sometimes, like, who here? ever like purposely tries to learn the lyrics of a song? Every once in a while. How many of you know some lyrics to songs? Like the words to songs? Yeah, like all, a lot of us do, right? And they just get stuck in our head and it's like, oh wow, I know all those words, I didn't even really realize it. Um, and so that's kind of the point of the songs. Um, I know some people hate them, some people love them. Um, like it or not, we're gonna have them because they do stick in your head. And if it sticks in your head by accident, that's kind of learning our science material kind of indirectly without you using up any extra energy. You just kind of figure it out and, and it, it sticks there with you, okay? So um, just be aware that that's part of the reason why we do the songs. It's not to always torture you. It's uh, to actually help you without you even realizing it really. All right, so. Um, Again, that's just the first one of many songs that we will get to. So we're gonna start, um, this is slide number five. If you look off to the kind of left-hand side of your slides or your notes, you'll see it has like slide number three, slide number four. So it kind of keeps you oriented where we're at. Sometimes there'll be some that are skipped that I have up here that you don't really need anything on your paper. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. Most of the time it goes in order, but there will be a few slides that get skipped and that's you know, intentional. So we're gonna start with the controlled experiment. So yesterday we talked briefly about a controlled experiment, which was very set, very planned, um, very hands-on with how it's, um, the scientist is setting it up. 
The field experience or the field observation is just basically observation and collecting data, not interfering with what's going on naturally. Is that you? Okay, just making sure. You're fine. Um, unless you need something. Good? No. Oh. It says hi. Okay, you just do what you need to do, okay? Um, okay, so I'm going to go over these steps briefly and then we'll get into them a little bit more in detail because most of what we do is a controlled experiment, all right, not the field observation. So, first of all, you identify a problem or a question, right? Then you're going to research and gather information about that. Then you're going to form a hypothesis. You're going to write down the procedures and materials. You're going to perform the experiment. So you're actually going to do it. I call this like the Nike phase. Just do it. You're going to collect and record data. Because what's the point of doing the experiment if you're not going to mark down what happened during the experiment? Then you're going to use that data to um, try to analyze and figure out what's going on. Right? So part of that is maybe making graphs and tables so you can see patterns and trends. And when you analyze, sometimes it's harder when you just have random numbers and things all spread out. So if you can organize it into some kind of graph, that usually is helpful to help you form a conclusion. And then finally, communicate those results with maybe um, fellow scientists. Um, here in class, we share our results with each other, with different groups. Um, and sometimes, like, even if we do something like, you know, if you want to go home and tell your family about it, like, just, it can be very informal like that. It can also be very um, formal, like, from a professional scientist's point of view, like, by writing a formal paper or having a big presentation over what you've found out. Okay, so notice, how many steps do you see here? How many, Luke? Nine. There's nine. Sometimes if you would like Google the scientific method, you might find where maybe there's five, or maybe there's, you know, three, or, well, three is probably pretty small. Maybe there's seven, right? So the number is not important because if there are, let's say, only six or seven steps, they've just combined some of these together. Here, I keep it very separate, just so that you're aware of every little kind of difference. Sometimes they might, um, you know, combine the collecting and the analyzing all into one. Sometimes they might combine the conclusion and the communicating results. So, just because you see like five or six or seven steps doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean that this one's wrong. This is just a little bit more detailed and it separates the steps out. So I just always like to point that out because I don't want you to be like, uh, that's not what we learned. We learned that there's nine. Um, so the number isn't important. The process is kind of what's important. And I just have it very separated out um, just so you, know, you can see all the little details. So we're going to start with the very first one, which is identifying a problem or some type of question. And remember when I told you that this can be used for something besides just in science class or like by professional scientists? So I have, um, every day at lunch, I drink, I have sweet tea. And I have sweet tea that I make at home. And I have a bottle where I freeze a little bit of tea at night and then in the morning, I fill it up with liquid tea, and I have it in this little koozie deal, and that's my tea. And you might be like, why do you go to all that trouble? What are you doing? Well, I like my tea to be cold, okay? So I used to put ice cubes in my bottle, and then I would pour tea into it, and then it would get kind of diluted and just didn't taste very good, right? The problem also was that you guys will notice like when I'm teaching, like I take a drink and I put it down and then I was leaving like sweat rings all over and then I'd have papers there and like it was just making a big mess. So I had a problem, right? So I had to come up with a better way. I'm like, okay, I don't like the diluted tea and I don't like it leaving sweat rings everywhere, but I want my tea to be cold. So I had to figure out what to do, all right? And so I tried a few different things and I finally came up with this little solution and it works pretty well. 
right? And I've been using it for years and years and years. So just because, you know, and, and I kind of went through, and as I go through these steps of the scientific method, I'll kind of like identify it, but I identified my problem or what my question is. I need a better solution for my tea situation. What can I do? I have this problem. I need cold tea and I need it not to leave sweat rings everywhere. Okay? So it can be something that can help you with your daily life, not just in science class or, you know, with professional scientists. So it has to be a question that can be answered by doing some kind of experimentation. Okay? It has to be in question form. So what can I do to have cold tea that won't leave sweat rings everywhere? What can I do to my tea situation? Right? So I need to have an end in a question mark. And a good question is something that has to be able to be measured and analyzed. Okay, so I'll show you some examples of some bad ones here in a minute. So I could do that. Like I could try different, different setups with my tea and see how it works until I got to the one that I you know, just showed you that actually does work well. Choose a problem that you don't already know the answer to. If you're doing a experiment, like if I already know that this works and I'm happy with it, then why am I going to test it to see if it works? I try it every day. I know it works. So it'd be a waste of time. So if you're ever going to be, you know, trying to do something, you're, make it authentic. Like use it for something you really are trying to find the answer to. Okay. So here um, are some testable problems. What brand of laundry detergent is best at getting rid of stains? Seems simple enough, right? I could get Tide, I could get um, All, and I could get, I don't even know, Gain, right? I could have three different types of laundry detergents. I could have the same stain, and I could test to see which one of those, like if I take a little bit of it and scrub that same stain, which one gets the stain out best. That's very doable, right? So what is the effect of cigarette smoke on household plants? All right, so I have that this is awkward but doable. Why would it be awkward? What's awkward about that? Judah? Well, you have to smoke for something to smoke. Yeah, like if, if there's no smokers in the house, then you have to have smoke there to test this, which we don't really want to encourage like anybody to like have smoke around or start smoking just so you can test out this experiment or answer this question, right? So it, it, that's kind of the awkwardness about it, okay? Um, so is it doable? Sure, certainly if there's already a smoker in the house. Um, the other thing that might be difficult is if there is a smoker in the house, um, is there just a room where that person smokes or is there a location where that person doesn't smoke so that you can compare the non-smoking or the, the plants that weren't by the smoke and the plants that were by the smoke? So there'd be some things that would have to definitely be figured out. Um, my house is full of smokers and uh, they usually just sit in one room. Okay, yeah, and, and a lot of times that's the way it is. Um, so again, those would be details that would have to be kind of identified um, to, to make sure you can set up an experiment that would actually be testing what you're meaning to test. Um, so how does exercise affect heart rate? What do you guys think? If you exercise, what happens to your heart rate? Who thinks it goes down? Who thinks it goes up? Okay, so do we really need to test this? You guys all already know. Now, could you tweak it and be more specific? Sure, maybe test different types of exercise. Swimming versus running. Um, jump rope versus jumping jacks. I don't know, like you could test different types of exercise, but the way this is worded, we already know the answer to that. We don't need to test that. Okay, so not every question or not every problem is testable in a way that you know, really makes sense. Okay, so once you have the question or you've identified the problem that you're trying to find an answer to, now you do a little bit of research. And honestly, this is um, for us a lot of times the step that we skip because let's face it, research takes some time. And because it takes time, 
we don't want to waste all that time. And it's good to get the practice of it, but it's something that's not practical. We could use all of our time in eighth grade science researching things and not get to all the material we need to cover. So a lot of times I will cheat and I will give you the information, sometimes in notes, that the background information that you need to be able to do the activity or the lab that we're doing. Okay, so if you would do formal research, using multiple sources is important. Maybe books, newspapers, magazines, internet, video, um, maybe even like science journals, the order you get, um, you know, there are different resources that are a little bit more kind of official. Um, it helps inform your experiment. So the more you know about a topic, the better you can set up your experiment. If you don't know a whole lot about something, it's kind of hard to know how to set it up or what parameters or what, what procedures to set up. And it provides you the information or kind of like the history about your topic. This always reminds me of like a movie trailer, right? If you're like surfing on Netflix and you know how like automatically um, it plays like the trailer if you stay on like the little the image for a little bit for a certain show or movie or something. And then you're like, oh, that looks really good. And so, or you're like, yeah, that's not for me. So the trailer, in a way, kind of gives you a heads up about what the whole show is going to be about. Well, the research that you get kind of does the same thing. It gives you kind of that background on what to expect. This comes in paragraph form. So the question is in question form. Research should be explained, like the research that you, you collect should be put into a nice organized paragraph. And then we get to our hypothesis, right? Forming a hypothesis. And this is one of your vocab terms. And so it's an educated guess or a reasonable assumption to the problem that you identified in step one. It has to be directly related to answering that question or solving that problem. The hypothesis, that's its number one goal, is to kind of keep you on track as you go to set up the rest of your experiment. So having a good, well-written hypothesis is pretty critical and, and crucial. Basically, you're predicting how your experiment is going to end up. Even though I just said you don't want to do an experiment that you already know the results to, you're, you don't know for sure, but it's what you believe is going to happen. You have to have some kind of thought on how you think it's going to go, and that's what happens in the hypothesis. Even if you're totally wrong, that's okay. Being wrong is not an issue. You just have to kind of put yourself out there, make that prediction, and then go with it. This is actually not a question. It is a statement. It is um, very set, it is very firm, and there's a format that we're actually going to follow. Hopefully that sounds familiar from Mrs. Heil. So it's not a question, but it is a statement. And let me know like, if I'm going too fast or you know, if, if you're having trouble, I try to watch like see how well you're writing and stuff, but let me know if I click too fast. So the hypothesis, there's some rules. There is a, there is a format, so there are some things that you do and there's some things that you don't do. One thing that you don't do is use the words I think or I predict. That is very redundant. What does redundant mean? Anybody know? What's it mean, Aiden? Uh, very predictable. Um, not quite. Close. Kind of similar. What does redundant mean? If I say, um, I also like that as well. It's kind of a redundant statement. What do you think? Like the same thing. Yeah, it's like you're repeating, right? It's redundant. Like, you don't need to say that. Like, you already just said that. So if you are giving a hypothesis, it's already implied that it's what you think and it's what you predict is going to happen. Now, did I make up these rules? Nope. This is science and you're going to see that there's a lot of just science procedure, science um, rules that every scientist follows and who exactly came up with it, I don't know. 
but it's kind of the, the set rules that govern science. So this is one of them. In a hypothesis, you don't put I think or I predict. All right, so a hypo here's the formula. Um, a, a hypothesis is stated in something called the if-then form. You use the words if and you use the word then. Those are the two words that have to be in every hypothesis. Here's an example. If I test to see which material, A or B, becomes saturated the quickest, then material B will become saturated the quickest. So anybody know what saturated means? I think. Like soak through something? Absolutely, like how much does it soak up? So like a sponge can be saturated when it's totally full of water. Um, that's usually a lot of times saturated just means that soaking or absorbing. So you have two types of materials and you want to see which one will absorb or soak up the most liquid, the quickest. All right. So if and the word then. So here's the format. If and then you put the situation. So my situation is I test to see which material A or B becomes saturated the quickest. After the word then, is the prediction. This person predicts that B will soak the quickest. It will become saturated the quickest. So this is the format that you always use. The word if, give a little description of the situation, the word then, and then you put what you predict. Don't say I predict and don't say I think. Just state it. Material B will become saturated the quickest. All right, so in the previous example, testing materials A and B for quick saturation is the, is the situation. That is the if. So everything in yellow is our if. Everything in this teal stating material B will saturate the quickest is the prediction. It is our then. So if you use that as kind of a formula, it's pretty easy. After if, gives your situation, put your word then, and you make your prediction without using the words I think or I predict. Does that sound familiar? From last year, Mrs. Heil should be, should have had the same, anybody? Yes, no, too long ago. Most eighth graders, usually somebody's like, yeah, that sounds familiar. Kind of? Okay. All right. So, with the hypothesis, all right, you're trying to prove if your hypothesis is correct, right? You're making that prediction that material B is going to saturate the quickest, right? But many times, all you're going to do is it prove that your hypothesis was wrong. Not that it's not well written, not that it's in a bad format, but that your prediction actually was off which is fine because you're just making that educated guess. You don't really know. You're just, it's kind of what you think is going to happen, right? And so then you do the experiment to actually test were you right or were you not right. And so it's okay if you're wrong. It, don't panic. You still have learned something. It is not a failure. You learn just as much from a mistake as you do from making something uh, or, you know, doing something right. Um, I know when I was in school, the questions that I would miss were the ones that always stuck with me. I don't remember the ones I got right, like I like, didn't even look at them, but it was the ones I got wrong that I always looked at and I'm like, oh, and then I wouldn't forget them again. Like, that's what stuck with me, what I got wrong. And so you learn just as much from what you do wrong as for, you know, the things that you got right. Same thing with an experiment. Okay, you still know more after completing the experiment than you knew before or, you know, going into it. And that's important. The whole point about science is to learn. Okay. And obviously, if you realize that what you thought was wrong or what you thought was right is actually wrong, well, that's learning something. Now, do we like to be wrong? No. Typically, we like to be right. Um, 
but that's not always in our control. And so any new knowledge is good knowledge, even if it means that you are wrong about your prediction. Okay, um, so who here has ever done a Google search for anything? Who here has ever got on Google and made a search? Okay, who here has ever like put in, you know, whatever it is you're searching and then like 10 minutes later you're like on some random site and you're like, what was I looking up again? What was I doing? Does that ever happen? Be so honest. you walk into a room and barely turn your Walking the gate. Same kind of thing. You get distracted, right? You're like, oh, that catches your eye and you click on that link. And then something in that page catches your eye and you click on another link. And then the next thing you know, you're like so far away from what you were actually starting to search for in the first place that you're like, wait, what? What was I doing? That can happen very easily with an experiment. So with the saturation, I even caught myself saying it. It was wanting to test how quickly the materials soaked, not how much. And I said how much was the, were the materials able to soak up. They weren't testing, they didn't want to test how much liquid soaked up. They were wanting to time how quickly those materials tested or soaked up. And so it's really easy if you don't have a well-written hypothesis to get off track. So you could have this great hypothesis which material, um, A or B, is going to be the one that soaks up the quickest. But if you don't have that written that you're looking up, you're trying to find the quickest, you might accidentally be start setting up your experiment and measure the amounts that get absorbed. And then that doesn't match your hypothesis. So Googling something and getting off track is really common. Well, same thing, if you don't have a well-written hypothesis, it's really easy to get off track, and then you set your experiment up for something that it's really not even matching the hypothesis that you had written. So the hypothesis is like your guiding light. Keep referring back to it, and that way you can stay on track, and you're actually testing and gathering data on what you mean to be testing and gathering data on. So. Um, that will keep you on track and so not doing this is a problem like I see it a lot like you might be really close you're on topic you're testing saturation and you're testing two materials but instead of testing how quickly they absorb or become saturated you might have been accidentally measuring the amount that they're measuring or excuse me the amount that they're absorbing and so it's similar but it's not quite right. Yes? Uh, it's not about this, but have you seen a movie called Blade? No, and we're going to stay on track. Don't get me off track, Aiden. You never know. I have a hard time. Sometimes I, would, I do wander, like kind of we all do. So there's a lot to writing a good hypothesis. And we're going to spend a couple days practicing that. Um, just so, um, you know, again, it is such an important part because if you don't have a well-written hypothesis, then you can go off on all these tangents and that becomes a problem. Um, and so we definitely need to make sure that, you know, you have a pretty good understanding of how to write a well, write a well-written one, okay, and following that format. Um, all right, let's go ahead. Um, let's stop there.